Okay, now. Okay, now. Christy, is this? Yes, it's on. Can you lower it a little bit? The back of Yeah. God, I can see you guys. <laughs> the paper I wrote is I have to make sure I'm qualified. Because they always ask me, why do you talk about Igrut? Igrutska. So I tried to look for that connection and I found it. My father is Tagalog from Malabon Rizal, the superior Tagalog who looked down on everybody, especially the Lucano and the Visayans. So you can think, what would they think of the Igorot? That is a very strong uh, social reality in the Philippines. I went to school here at the London School of Economics. They're very expensive, very prestigious, very postmodern school. I went to University of California, Berkeley, where I really learned what anthropology is all about. And finally, I went to school in UP Diliman for an English lit major, and then the University of San Francisco for uh, doctorate in education, bilingual multicultural ed, taught and administered with the public schools in America, California, and finally ended up teaching Philippine culture and society at the City College of San Francisco. And so when I retired from public schools, I went back to Baguio, started a lecture series, which fortunately turned out very, very well with the help of uh, Cordillera Scholars, Bakdayan, Maganon, Kibitin, uh, Saboy, and now it's published and you can take a look at it outside and it's still continuing. We hope to get the next uh, series uh, early next year. And what I noticed was the Ibaloi ethnolinguistic group was not well represented in academic uh, achievements. So I look into this, and uh, Professor Fong, who teaches Ibaloi at UP Baguio, and I held a conference, so we had a new book called Chiva, which means uh, storytelling in the Ibaloi language. My topic is the origins of the word ego. You know, <laughs> I'm so used as a Baguio girl to say ego rot. And when I first came here, the man at the immigration said, Ma'am, what is Igwats? What? What is Igwats? Oh, I don't know what that is. This one, you said you're going to give a talk on the Igwats. Oh, Igoro, yes, yes, Igoro. Let me get this clear in Ilocano. When the Ilocano says Igoro, with the emphasis on the first word, it's bad. It's very, very low-witted. Igurut daita. That means, oh boy, he's an igurut. Igurut iso. Oh boy, he's an igurut. That is the Ilocano, most Ilocano perception of the igurut. However, what I would like to tell you is both historical and psychological why this happened. There are three parts of my paper. Part one explores the historical background, when and why the Spaniards colonized the Philippine archipelago. Coloni colonization means the domination of one country over another territory or territories. 
And one of these long colonization of the archipelago meant the interaction of the Spaniards with the natives. The beginning of the word Igorot actually started way, way back in the 1500 when the Philippines was discovered. At that time, historically, Spain and Portugal were in competition in search of the spice trade in the Moluccas. Moluccas is in the Celebes Sea, part of Indonesia, uh, below the Philippines, and uh, just above New Guinea. Part to explore the historical background of how the United States of America acquired the Philippine archipelago. The reaction of the American rulers to the upland peoples of the Cordillera, and what the word Igorot, first coined by the Spanish colonizers, meant to the second colonizers, American administrators, military, and missionaries. Part three is a part process of decolonization. It refers to the intellectual decolonization coming from the colonizers' idea that made and made the colonized feel inferior. So what I'm talking about is events that led to the gradual change of the word Igorot from the 50s to the present 2080s and its effect on the people, on the so-called Igorots. Historian John Phelan wrote of the mindset of the Spaniards during the long quest for imperialism. Remember, the 1500 was very, very exciting. Age of discovery, age of exploration, when all of Europe were rushing, trying to get colonies. Spaniards, you have to know where the Spaniard is coming from. Spaniards of all classes during the 16th century were inspired by an almost limitless faith in their nation's power and prestige. The Spanish race appeared to them as God's new chosen people, destined to execute the plans of the providence. Spain's mission was to force the spiritual unity of all mankind by crushing the Protestants of the old world, defending Christendom against the onslaught of the Turks, the Muslims, and spreading the gospel among the infidels of America and Asia. So you could see how uh, Spanish mind was really made up to conquer. It was the search for spice. The spice trade was a very lucrative business. First, the Portuguese were there, and they made a lot Economically, it made them really very powerful because they get a lot of funds for selling the spices in Europe. The Spice Island, as I told you, is in the Moluccas, part of Indonesia, and just above New Guinea. The Spaniards somehow had to find a way to get to, Mol to the Moluccas, but what happened was Ferdinand Magellan, who you know as the person who discovered the Philippines, crossed the straits that he named formerly Estrecho de Todos los Santos to Estrecho de Magallanes, which is located at the southern Chile, separating South America to the north and Tierra del Fuego to the south. This is the most important passageway from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. In 1490, the Ottoman Empire took Constantinople and controlled the spice trade route that existed at that time. Western Europeans' reaction to this event was, no, they did not want to depend on a non-Christian power for the lucrative trade with the East. Thus, the new search started, and that is how Magellan entered in the Philippine archipelago. The Philippines at that time was just made of a of few communities from a few hundred to a few thousand. 
there was no stopping the invasion of the Philippines. So eventually, Spanish hegemony was established. As you know, invasion is never accepted easily. This means that the, that the that practices that invaders put in place will be a heavy burden to the invaded. Spain, while in competition with the Dutch, made the Filipinos bore a great deal in defending the Philippine archipelago. Aside from that, also is the imposition of beliefs. The Spanish occupation had emphasized the conversion of Filipinos to become Christians. And this, by the way, was their most successful venture because 90% became Catholics, Filipinos. And that's also true as of today. The lowlands of the archipelago was first conquered, but the attempt to up to the upland proved very difficult for the Spaniards. Why? Because the mountaineers put up a strong resistance. The attempt to get hold of an economic motivation, the search for gold, and the attempt to Christianize the inhabitants of the Cordillera meant territorial occupation. However, historian Philan added one more reason. Aside from the inhabitants' defense of their territory, this has to do with financing the expedition. In the face of the uncompromising histority, hostility of the mountaineers and the resistance of Manila to underwrite the expenses of a prolonged costly territorial occupation, various military expedition. Expeditions in 1591, 1608, 1635 proved fruitless. During the revolution at the end of the Spanish regime, Englishman John Foreman remarked, the feeble efforts displayed to conquer them only serve to demonstrate the impotence of the Europeans. The impotence of the Europeans reminds me of Professor Dandes, a Freudian. But this is coming from an Englishman. William Henry Scott, Anglican lay missionary and educator, wrote in his article, The Origin of the Word Igorot Set. As far as the meaning of the word Igorot itself, Dr. Trinidad Padre de Tavera, an eminent Tagalog scholar at the end of the century, stated, that it was really made up of the word gulot, gulot, meaning mountain chain, and then the prefix I, L, meaning people of, or, that it was composed of the root word gulot, meaning mountain chain, and the prefix L, meaning people of or dwellers in. Scott explained how the word Gurut eventually became a Gurut. The word Gurut therefore appears to be perfectly indigenous Filipino in origin, and this form that first appeared in Spanish records. The substitute of the letter R for L of the word did not become popular until the 18th century when Antonio Moza, who spelled it Igurut himself in his 1763 Noticia Historico, Natural commented, corrupted the words they were want to call it Igorot. Scott made the comment that there is no record that the people in question themselves Igorots. So you do have to get that uh, straight. It, this word did not come from the people, from the mountaineers, okay? They, they called themselves according to their Ili. So if they were in from an Ili of Bontok, Sagada, Kalinga, whatever, that's what they call them. They didn't call themselves Igorots. The Americans' authority, however, did also find that out, that they did not call themselves Igorots, they called themselves according to their village or the Ili. In 1885, uh, the exposition. Actually, uh, Professor uh, 
I'm more or less explained what was going on, like the St. Louis Fair, so you know about that, uh, and what it meant. Finally, I should go to Freya, Freya or Father Angel Perez. He wrote a book called Igorotes Geográfico, y Etnográfico sobre algunos distritos del norte, Luzon, as one published in 1902. He came to the Philippines in 1884, and he included in his writing what Father Diaz, another priest, Augustinian, by the way, said, the Igros are a barbaric people of little intelligence, distress, deceitful, cunning, and cruel, a sure sign of cowardice. They are little constant in their false religions, but they are very superstitious. They believe in divination. They practice bigamy, marrying many women. They cheat and kill with great skill. However, Scott, in his book, Discovery of the Igorots, under the title, Igorot Ethnography, contradicts Father Perez. Why? He said, Igorots was known among all non-Igorot observers for strict social adherence to monogamy and all their stern death sentence for adultery or even intimidations of adultery except to Casimiro Diaz, who practiced what he said was a good beginning. At the Madrid Zoological Exposition, where there were igorots exhibited with others, Dr. Jose Rizal was the one who made a protest. He was, and he, this is what he said in a letter to Blumentritt, I wish they would all die and suffer no more. Let the Philippines forget that her sons have been treated like this to be exhibited and ridiculed with animals and plants. Remember, it's a zoology, zoological exhibition. The mindset of the Americans and the uh, Spaniards showed a similarity. However, their methods of employing their aims, there was a big difference. The Spaniards, of course, were only successful in terms of the religious, of the introduction of religion, Christianity, which, by the way, Christianity means civilized, and if you're not a Christian, you're a pagan, then you're uncivilized. You have to remember that distinction. Who is civilized and who is uncivilized? The United States was emerging as a world power in the beginning of the century, and uh, in a battle with the Spaniards, easily took the Philippines, and Philippines was easily an annexed at the Treaty of Paris. Here is American imperialism challenging Philippine nationalism. And the Philippine-American War was a brutal war, something that we really are not aware of, but it was brutal. By the time the uh, Americans took over the Philippines, the word Igorod had native connotations. This is a perception first of some Spaniards, but with the colonizers, second colonizers. One of them was still that Professor Amore said, when he went to the uh, Philippines, he said, uh, he said that the uh, Bontok Igorots were honest and truthful. So he was on the positive side of uh, defining what an Igorot is. He also mentioned the shortcomings of the lowland, and this is why he was so uh, gung-ho on separating the two groups, lowlanders and the uh, uplanders. One of the Americans who was very successful was Jeff Galman. He was brave, he was uh, a fighter, and he was honest, and he was a strict disciplinarian. And in American view of the Philippines, what came out was Jeff Galman up to the present is quite a, a character. They always referred to him as uh, Mangamunan ni Galman, meaning 
Leave it to Galman. He, he, he'll solve it for you very well. Finally, I'd like to talk about the lowland perception. And this will not take long because my time is almost up. One of the most devastating events was when a very well-known journalist, diplomat from Camille Interlac, said in his book, Mother America, the Igoros are not Filipinos. Really, that was very, uh, a very strong statement. Of course, people objected to that. The other one was uh, Baguio X Mayo, who said, the Igros are dirty, they urinate everywhere, they are deceitful, you have to be careful. One of the worst things that happen is when a UP graduate, a female lowlander of media popularity said, I am not an Igorot, I am a human being. So you could see that the uh, uh, the uh, stigma, the uh, putting down of Igorot continued with the lowlanders. The designation of Igorot as pagans, uncivilized, immoral, etc., etc., apparently added more negative connotations to present uh, non-Igorots. By the way, when I'm talking about Igorots, I'm talking of the inhabitants of Benguet. I'm confining that. And also to the mountain province. In, the, in Benguet, that would be the Ibaloy, the Kankanai, the Karanguya. And in the mountain province, it would be the Kankanai speakers and others. One of the things that came to my attention was what Albert Bakdayan said. Do you know of the closet igorot? What is a closet igorot? A closet igorot is an igorot who denies his identity, his or her identity. That's why he's hiding in the closet. That happened with the older generation mostly, not all, but mostly. However, with the younger generation, as Professor Amore showed you, there is a resurgence of pride in being an Igorot. There is, at present time, a continuing consciousness of what is known as decolonization. And even Gerald Finian, who wrote a book on Igorot consciousness, testified to the fact that, yes, beginning in the 50s, Organizations, political, uh, as well as other organs, social, meant that the Filip that the Igorots were beginning to be conscious that they are not lesser of their brothers in the lowland, but they are just as good as their brothers in the lowlands. Now it is now 2018, and. Uh, what can we say about the status of the Igorot? In the city of Baguio, where I was born, I grew up. In the 50s, the Bibak uh, that uh, so Professor Morris also mentioned became very active. They became very political. When they went overseas, because they're hard workers, they were, success, they were very successful. And one of the most successful examples I found was when I was doing my research on Kabunyan in Kabayan, and I saw this calendar, it says, Putin. I said, who is Putin? Aha, he has an office in Germany, in London, etc. What does he do? Aha, he's a businessman, very successful, as I said. So you could see then what I'm saying is that the Igorots have gone a long way. They have become equal. And actually, some of them are better off than their lowland brothers. I also want to share with you the daughter of Albert Bakdayan, who recently became a judge in New York. An Igorot judge in New York and a woman at that. So I think that says a lot. Thank you for listening. And questions?
Great. So we have about five minutes to um, for, to open the floor for questions. Who is a brave soul who wants to ask a question? Come on, guys. You're wasting time. Carmen. Carmen. So if Igorot or Igolot began as a simple descriptive term, when and why did it turn into a pejorative? When and why it turned into Igorot? In, into a pejorative, into an insult. I told you it was Mosul who, uh, who was... Uh, who coined that word gulot and changed the L to R. That's not my question. What's your question? It started off as a descriptive term, simple descriptive term, people who live in the mountains. When and why did it turn into a pejorative, into an insulting term? I can answer if, uh, if Thank you for helping, sweetheart. <laughs> Good morning, uh, sir. Uh, I could help answer that because uh, I've also been doing some re research and in my research, uh, it has um, been known that the Igorots have been resilient uh, to the Spanish conquest. Mm -hmm. And so if, they, if the Spaniards would uh, build villages in the lowlands and in the highlands, the Igorots would come and burn these um, churches. And so the, um, the Spanish have labeled them barbaric. They are difficult. They are a <laughs> in the world. They do not uh, succumb. To what we want. So the term until now, uh, a bit, um, it has stick a little bit because, uh, also because when they were going around the Cordilleras looking for the gold that they found in the lowlands, they asked the lowlanders, where is your gold coming from? So the lowlanders said, it's from the igolots. From the, so they followed these igolots looking for the mountain gold but they didn't have it easy as well. So um, because of that resilience of the Igorots, um, the, the fights or the, um, the, ex the, the expeditions uh, that was from the Spanish expeditions to the mountains of the Cordillerans didn't succeed, Did it, didn't uh, turn as they hoped. And so this, this history was kept in their books. It wasn't out in the in the open, like in the Philippine histories. It wasn't. So they they labeled us Igorots as uh, barbarics, as I've said. So it seems it stuck a little um, throughout the centuries as well. So was the was the problem a failure of political control or a failure to convert the Igorots? Yes, um, it's both. Um, 